Okay, 1 p.m. Welcome, welcome. This is MED 140, Basic Clinical Procedures. It is now 1 p.m., our Zoom meeting time, uh, Friday the 30th. And this is now officially week three. So what is due today? All week two items, which is homework two, uh, discussion two post. And in theory, it's due right now. But uh, if you didn't do it, I'll give you till closing of business today, meaning 10 p.m. Uh, but do know and understand, um, uh, as per the syllabus, as per day one, in theory, it's supposed to be due uh, right now. Um, if Remember, late is better than not at all. Um, late protocols start after 10 p.m. After 10 p.m. for every uh, for every day it's late, it will be minus 10% off. Okay, so please, please uh, get that uh, get those items in. Um, there's a nice little hand washing video. Also, don't forget your quizzes. Uh, one or two of you have reported in that um, uh, that you took the quiz, but uh, it's not recording or, or whatever. Um, retake it only one more time and if it doesn't work that second time uh you can either um you screenshot it and then uh send it back to me and then i'll put out a um i'll put out a um a help desk ticket to see what's going on um these uh this particular lecture was supposed to be because this is a laboratory class we're supposed to um i allotted week three week four uh, for typically if we were on the ground for um, uh, laboratory, but uh, look at the laboratory dates that are up here in your announcements. Uh, please confirm that you, uh, you are coming because if you do not RSVP, uh, I can't allow you on campus. And the two dates are for the first session and second session. And for anyone uh, who missed, it's for this, uh, for this date. And if you can't make any of these dates, I need to know, like today. Um, because uh, the campus policy is, if you don't have an RSVP, I don't know how many people are on campus. If I don't know how many people are on campus, I cannot adhere to the social distancing and all the things that we have to do um, to maintain OSHA compliance for, our, for the school, okay? With that being said, now that all the service announcements are out of the way, Let's jump right into emergencies. And I have notes here, right? Um, and also uh, these old videos I made, but they're kind of uh, uh, the, the quality um, regarding the um, videography and the sound may not be optimal, but they're there anyway. Um, here's an extra uh, history form and uh, history form samples, but uh, that was part of uh, last week's uh, homework, um, or you could have Googled it. So let us now go into our textbook and uh, we look for the chapter on emergencies. Now, if you're going into your uh, typical doctor's office, uh, you're not going to get uh, uh, too many emergency situations. Because as, uh, as some of you who already work in the business know that if the patient, um, like a, if a walk-in comes in and demands to be seen by the doctor, um, if the patient is in uh, um, distress, either uh, cardiovascular distress or pain, they are advised to go to the emergency room. They're not advised to come to the office in an office setting because in, uh, in an office setting that's inappropriate to, uh, to, to deal with emergency situations. So let's see, what chapter was it on? Um, I think it was in therapeutics. Forgive me, let me look in my notes, see if it tells us. Now, um, also another thing about the notes and outlines I have, they're a little, they're, they're, they're oh, it's chapter 57. So they're, um, what do you call that? They are, based on the same textbook, but uh, from a textbook from uh, a couple of editions ago. So the, um, the pages may not match, but as you can see here, chapter 57, emergency preparedness, the, the chapters do match. 
So let's look at this case and remember you're also responsible for any case that we discuss. So um, Muhammad Nassar, right? Um, let's give him an age, let's say 13 year old uh, male uh, student. His mother brings him today in the office. He has flu-like symptoms, high fever, chills, muscle aches, and cough. Now, pre-COVID, that's, that's not an issue. Nowadays, uh, this is an issue. May not, uh, he may not be warranted to come to our office. Um, uh, uh, but we'll see the rest of this history, so we'll see what happens. Past medical history of asthma. He's relatively stable. He has a new maintenance dose of albuterol. Uh, extended release, eight milligrams BID. Um, he has aches all over and he feels like he's freezing, right? So he has aches and uh, uh, fever, aches and chills. And remember the chief complaint must be in the patient's words. No current history of uh, influenza vaccination. And the, uh, this is most likely either pediatrics or um, you know, a general practitioner will be seeing here and the, the person who saw them today was Dr. Elizabeth Williams. And he has an, an uh, allergy of animal dander. Okay, so come in, he has flu-like symptoms. Now here is another backstory here. There are other patients who are now tested positive for influenza type A. Now, viruses and flu by itself is not a horrible thing. COVID by itself is not a horrible thing, but the sequelae, that is what happens next, especially in an immunocompromised patient. And he, it looks like um, he's, uh, uh, he's got um, a predispos predispos predisposing factor, his asthma. And also he's a kid. He could be going through midterms, had going through some stress right? The stress of COVID, the stress of online learning, that kind of thing, right? So I, there's a potential. So we did a rapid screening, influenza screening test. It's not positive. Now, uh, we saw other patients this morning and now he's the eighth one. That is a problem. So odds are, uh, as a walk-in, um, as a former medical assistant for, uh, goes, uh, and former office manager, I wouldn't let him in the office. And if you have multiple positive cases of the same thing on the same day or the same week, that's, um, that warrants reporting, okay? So that's uh, something that you, ha um, you remind your physician. Did we lose somebody? Okay, I hope she connects back in. Um, so we have to keep our case in mind when we're going through things. But this is, uh, in the past, this wouldn't be an emergency, but if you see the rest of uh, this history and also the historical context of, uh, of this particular office, there's look like, um, look like there's a, a little mini epidemic going on in this particular office. And like I said, the flu in theory isn't, uh, isn't a bad thing, but it goes in an immunocompromised patient, um, it, it, goes, it, it, it can be deadly. And everyone's focusing on COVID but uh, do remember that last year, um, uh, flu, um, um, uh, flu fatalities last year, which by the way, your typical flu is a coronavirus as well. Flu fatalities were anywhere from 240 to 260,000 people last year, as in people who died, okay? And that's definitely flu, um, that's pre-COVID, right? So that's why me as a, professor of epidemiology, as an internist, I don't understand why we're making such a hullabaloo. Uh, oh, so many deaths. Really? Look at other things that kill you. I'd be, I'm more concerned about uh, kidney failure in this country and uh, juvenile diabetes. It's indirectly killing a whole bunch more people. But again, remember, make your own decisions. Look at the data yourself. Don't, don't just take my word for it. That's also another problem uh, in, in education as a whole. Um, many professors are saying, hey, listen to me as if it was the word of whatever higher power. No, I'm just a guy who, uh, who's seen some stuff and is preparing you for uh, your eventual or further of your career. So 
as always, there has to be a plan in your office and you have to have an emergency plan for, uh, um, for eventualities. It may never happen, but you should be ready. And one of the things that you should have be ready is in your office, you should have a laminated uh, um, set of cards that, um, that have the specific emergency numbers. Like for example, for the Department of Health, if there's a, um, any uh, epidemics or pandemics that are going around in your area. Also, um, uh, drug abuse and substance abuse control numbers. Those are also very important. And of course, we activate nine, the EMS system or the 911 system. Be ready to answer basic questions when you call 911. Have the chart, re have the chart ready, full name of the patient, and uh, age and, and, and what's going on. Uh, because when I was working for EMS, when I did dispatch, asking simple questions like, where is the victim? What's the victim's name? Um, what's the address? And when people are excited, they tend to forget very basic things like, where are you? Who are you? What's the name of the patient? And they get flustered. Um, so have um, actually my office when I was a medical assistant had this little card that we laminated um, and it was underneath the blotter of my desk. So if there was an emergency situation, I get out that card and it has a script on exactly what I should do in case of this emergency or that emergency. Another thing that we also have besides the telephone numbers, uh, right, and our little protocol here, name, telephone number, location, nature of emergency. Oh, by the way, regarding location, be specific because um, again, as a former EMT, um, especially going into a, an apartment complex that I've never seen, when I'm given specific directions, I can get to the victim quicker instead of, oh, somewhere on the fourth floor and then I'm prancing around uh, trying to look for things, okay? Uh, the, 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 the crash cart. Now, crash cart, uh, in your typical office, we don't usually have a crash cart. The crash cart in um, uh, the, ooh, we got a chat question. My voice keeps on cutting off. Anybody else, is my voice cutting off? Because if it's only one person, that means it's your server and it's not mine. Check one, two, it goes answer either on chat or is, is the voice good? Yes, no, maybe, because my internet is full bars and no one else said anything. Did everyone else check out or hello? 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 It goes in and out sometimes, but I'm just kind of ignoring it because it doesn't do it too badly. All right, so if it's not too bad and also you can, um, um, what do you call that? Um, since it's recording off my microphone, um, of course I make this, uh, um, 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 what do you call that? I make this available so that it'll be in its entirety with me not cutting out. Or just post a question on the last part, you know, on the, on the chat and I'll monitor the chat a little bit more closely. So even if my uh, voice cuts in and out, maybe I should speak louder or closer. Is I think it's my internet because my son is also doing Zoom and his computer went out too. So, but we okay. back on, it goes in right. and out. But if it's something you missed, put it on the chat and then I'll just reiterate it. Or I can, like, uh, uh, I can uh, type it here uh, on the screen as well. All right? Okay. Okay. So the next part is da, 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 da. you need supply. And in your typical doctor's office, you have all of these things. But let's say um, you're in a remote clinic or you're doing a medical mission and things of that matter. Like for example, when we used to go out for medical missions, I have what I call a go bag. All the things that, you know, uh, that just in case uh, emergencies happen. Like for example, last year, it's good that I had an emergency pack because um, I was there in, um, uh, we were at a Baptist church uh, somewhere in Southeast and I had four nurses with me and one of my nurses for whatever reason engaged up on a, a patient who fainted in the hallway. Now in theory we're not supposed to touch anybody because is that our duty but she made the she made the conscious decision to go help this person and kudos to her 
uh, but uh, we had our Ambu bag. We had um, uh, that connected to, we, they had an extra pack of oxygen somewhere. And we had also, um, there's this uh, a face mask specifically for CPR. It's um, um, the most common one is Laerdal. Let me see if I can find it. This for when you do CPR. And let's see uh, for your face. Yeah, here's here's one. It's like a, a, a like a face shield you could use, but the the one I have is an actual mask that can. Um, uh, let's see if they have here. Yeah, so it's like kind of like a covering. So when you do CPR, um, and you could have that, and they they come in these disposable packs. But I had one of these bad boys in my um, um, and my bag, so it's nice because this pocket mask you could do your CPR here. You can uh, you know uh, blow into your uh, patient's face, and when EMS comes, they can attach the Ambu bag onto this little uh, um, uh, this little device here, so that if the patient requires oxygen, it's an easy transition. Okay. So here's your, you know, you just look over, here's your typical things that you need and we, we little packets of saline solution. And of course, all of it's sterile. Okay, uh, the scissors, try to get, you know, if you have, if you wanna create one of these, and actually you can buy one of these on eBay. Uh, they, um, you know, these uh, um, emergency go bags, um, they're, they run anywhere from 60 to $150, depending on, you know, what level uh, you want it, and if you get the one hundred fifty dollar one um, that has a um, an emergency um, it, it has an emergency um, um, uh, what was I saying? Um, it has emergency surgical kit for uh, for for quick surgery, and the kind of scissors you should get are these. If you want to build one of these in your own home, they're emergency medical service shears. Oh, this is neat. They got all these little, but just a basic, basic like five or ten dollar one. This one right here. Um, this, these are awesome because they can cut all these things, um, and also they can cut through a penny, and they're indestructible. I still have my set from thirty years ago, and it's still fine. I used it all throughout medical school all throughout my residency and it's fine. Um, what else is interesting here? Uh, and basic meds you should always have in your go bag, uh, diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl, and also acetaminophen, uh, um, which is uh, Tylenol, okay? Now, there's guidelines and we already talked about. It. Now, in the physical examination, we always look we always do, uh, before we do a head to toe assessment, you're always looking at the patient as a whole. Um, another thing that you're gonna try to do is um, uh, gauge the level of responsiveness, okay? So if they're a bit on the stuporous side, like they're like uh, they're dizzy, they're slurring their speech, these are things that emergency medical service personnel need to know. And also looking, um, don't immediately touch your patient, just look at them and assess first, right? Then you can do your ABCs, now known as CABs, which is circulation, airway, and breathing. So of course you uh, see if they have a, um, a carotid pulse, you should know where that is uh, from the previous lecture. You put your ear to their, uh, um, to their mouth and their nose to see if there's uh, any breathing going on, right? Uh, and also to to also establish that the airway is patent. And once you go through that, and if anything is missing, what do you do? You initiate CPR, okay? Now, uh, prior priority and urgency, again, if you're already initiating CPR, that's already contacting 911. Then what you can do is uh, do a head-to-toe assessment and of course, document the history. How did that patient get 
uh, get to where uh, get to this point. So essentially, you're documenting chief complaint and the history of present illness. Okay. So in general, I could ask you a question. What do you always do first? Do you touch them? Do you move them? No. You always look and assess first. Get a general impression. Then check the level of responsiveness. Now, um, orientation, right, is one of those things that you, uh, you assess to see if the patient is all there. Because you know that sometimes the patient may be conscious, but they're not all there. Um, and uh, that falls under the category of stupor. S-T-U-P-O-R, or if they're stuporous. So um, that person, that's why you ask questions like, hey, do you know where you are? And that's um, orientation to uh, location. Um, hey, do you know what year it is? Now, even though they get annoyed, if they can't, if they can't answer you the year, then that's, a, that's also another problem regarding orientation. And then uh, you ask them, um, uh, hey, do you know who you are? Or do you know who I am? That kind of thing. And that's the third level of uh, orientation. So orientation or responsiveness, they're related. Orientation is within three spheres. The first sphere is person. Second sphere is place. And the third sphere is time. So person, place, and time. And like I stated with uh, regarding telephone emergencies, the protocol is always that please call 911, uh, um, uh, please call an ambulance, because if they are in either cardiorespiratory distress or any significant, uh, significant pain. And of course, overall, just stay calm, right? Act confident even though you don't know, you don't know what the heck's gonna happen. And it's an emergency. You don't know what's going to happen, but you have to stay calm. Someone has to be the calm person, okay? And uh, especially your first set of emergencies, your body's going to want to freak out and run. Don't, do not do that, and just follow your protocols. And there are more protocols at the end of the chapter uh, that will uh, um, um, guide you on how to do certain things as well. Personal protection. Do not touch that patient when you start doing your assessment with your hands. You glove up and nowadays you mask up, okay? So wear your PPE, uh, wear your PPE uh, uh, and, and, and remember your universal precautions. Universal, universal precautions deals with any blood or any of uh, the patient's body fluids or mucous membranes. Universal precaution means there's only a single standard. And the best way to look at it is, is you have to assume that all patients, all staff, that everyone has HIV, Ebola, Corona, as all of the above. So you must protect yourselves at all times. And one of those ways is, those, is that Laerdell pocket mask or the Laerdell um, disposable, um, um, you know, those uh, face shields. Cuts and lesions, again, uh, do not, touch your patient without gloves, all right? Uh, then, um, and just like anything, even before you glove up, um, you do your clinical scrub before, uh, before and after. Um, just actually, just like uh, last term, um, we had somebody uh, collapse in front of the front door. Uh, fortunately, I was hanging out in the front, uh, uh, front uh, at the front desk. Now, because what did I do? I kept calm, I assessed, called 911, did not touch him, left him there, but stood guard until EMS came. And when EMS comes, leave. Let them do their job. After they ask you the initial questions and you give them the information, right? Uh, you either get their names, get their badge number because you need to report where, you need to put in the patient's chart where, they, where did they take the patient so that the physician can follow up and that's documentation. So you got your goggles your, or face shield, gloves, right? And nowadays in the world of COVID, that's all of the above. Now let's look at some accidents and um, they will go in greater detail if you take, um, um, you know, the CPR with CPR BLS, basic life support, with first aid. 
I highly suggest since you guys are medical professionals, yeah, take your, you know, the 24 or the $27 CPR course, you know, so uh, you can have that ready for your externship. But overall, I would recommend the $100 one and there's even a $130 one, which is basic life support and emergencies with CPR and defibrillation. So all of these things, because you'll never know when you, I goes, when you may encounter these things or may encounter these emergencies in your own personal life. So animal, animal bites. So um, animal bites, yeah, I have concerns about it, right? And uh, the best bet is to always try to uh, corral the animal if you, if you've had, if you could find it or um, have, um, uh, you know, take a picture and try to identify what bit, uh, what bit, who, and when, okay? So, you know, it's going to squirrel and hamsters, or was it a pet and do you still have it? Because uh, we, the main issue is we're looking for rabies, okay? Um, and most people don't get the vaccination, uh, but uh, we're gonna be looking for rabies immunoglobulin inside the patient's, blo uh, patient's blood. So that's your typical animal bites. But in real life, in a clinical world, we're more concerned of human bites. Because remember the uh, universal precautions we talked about? If you punch somebody in the face and you cut your hand on their teeth or their mouth, that is of concern because then you're at risk for Hep B and HIV. All right, so uh, that's something of concern. Uh, uh, when, when people get into fights or uh, people get um, bite wounds from another human being. Um, insect stings, again, you try to, uh, um, uh, don't do any surgery. It, if the stinger is still there, you know, uh, keep it in its place or remove it, um, uh, remove it with a set of tweezers and then put it in a nice little uh, bag. And when you put it in the bag, you put the date, the time, and the, and the patient, and the location of where the sting was, where the bite was, or if there were multiple bites. And again, the, the main concern about, uh, um, um, about allergies is anaphylaxis right here. And anaphylaxis is a true emergency. If someone goes into anaphylaxis, everything will start shutting down um, because it's, a, it's an extreme allergy. So you, if anyone has ever experienced it, it's horrible. Um, your, your throat starts closing up, you're, then you start breathing really, really fast. And then that's not good because many times when anaphylaxis progress, I can't get the intubation tube uh, down, my, uh, down my patient's trach. And that gets really bad. Snake bites, uh, especially here in Northern Virginia, I'm more concerned over tick and spider bites. Actually, there's a rise in tick and spider bites because a lot of people now, uh, you know, the weather's still good and, and uh, because of COVID, more people are, you know, going out on little nature walks. And again, just like the other animal bites, you try to either take a picture or try to figure out um, for EMS and for the emergency room, what bit them, when, and, and of course, always put down where right? And always put down multiple. I've, I've had cases where my patient had multiple bites and we only addressed the ones that we saw. Um, and then upon further review, there were more bites. And, uh, you know, again, goes back to a good history. Spider bites, same thing. Now let's go into something a little bit more, uh, more common. Uh, burns are more common. So, what are type of burns? You can have thermal burn, chemical burn, electrical burn. But what's more important to us are the classification of burns. So let's look at the three types of burns. So you have first degree, second degree, and third degree. Now the first degree is easy because it's only a superficial burn. It, uh, sunburn falls upon the first degree. Let's get some pictures. It's always better to look at pictures. 
So a first degree to burn, if you look at it, it only affects the epidermis. So it's not so bad and there is some pain and redness involved in it. Now a second degree burn, you could see it's at the level of the dermis, right? And you could see here, let's, let's see if we get a better, better picture. Ugh, of course, Pinterest. Let's see if I can take this. And then I could put it here. This is my lecture earlier. So if you look at the second degree burn, it's now at the level of the dermis. So you're going to have some blistering. And this also hurts as well. There's pain in the first degree and the second degree burn. Third degree burn into fourth is what we call a full thickness burn. This burn will not hurt because it is now at the level of your subcutaneous tissue and that has all of our nerves. So if you burned out all your nerves, you won't be able to feel anything. So first degree burn, think like level of sunburn, right? It hurts, but it's only in the superficial epidermal layers. Second degree burn, we're already at the dermis. There's some blistering. And third degree burn, uh, that's all the way at the level of the subcutaneous tissue. And um, your patient shouldn't feel anything. Now, one of the greatest concerns regarding burns is, I guess I'm not really too much worried about the burn, but remember the function of our skin. The function of our skin is to protect our skin. So if there's no more protection, that means all the 249, 250 uh, pathogens that are floating around in the air and on our skin will now go inside. And we do remember that if our skin isn't protecting us, then this becomes a point source of infection. So another thing that the skin does for us is that it also circulates fluid. So the two things that we're concerned about regarding especially a more extensive burn is one, of course, we mentioned infection, and the other is hydration. So especially on burns that are more extensive, um, uh, hydration and um, uh, antibiotics are warranted. Okay, so those are your three main burns and those are the, um, uh, the two main, oh, here's another one. And you could see here, on a third degree burn, it's burning all the way at the level of the subcutaneous tissue. And the other ones, that's why first degree and second degree still hurt because the nerves that are here in the dermis are still intact. But on the third degree burn, it's already uh, in the level of your subcutaneous tissue and it's gonna burn out all uh, your, um, uh, what the cozy? You'll burn all your nerves. Now, there's also another thing called the rule of nines, because another thing you should be able to also convey is um, um, how. Hold up, I'm being distracted. Hey, Nelson Hermy, can you close the door, please? Sorry about that. So, what's the rule of nines? So let's look at this. The rule of nines is a way of identifying, and you don't need to memorize it, you just need to know what it is and need to know about the burns. Because if I have a, a second degree burn just on my hand, it's no big deal. But if I have a second degree burn on half my face and like half my torso, that's a considerable amount of uh, percentage of my skin. And that's what the rule of nines is, is it's a way of identifying. And as you can see here, any burn on a baby is significant, okay? And uh, especially if they're smaller children, but as they grow older, like on an adult, uh, the burn percentages are less. And again, you don't have to memorize it, just understand that the rule of nines is uh, a classification of burn system. And by the way, that particular, I added that in because of that particular question was on the last AMA um, registry exam. Choking. Now, everyone goes, uh, talks about how the universal sign of choking is, you know, someone holding their, 
uh, holding their hand on their throat. No, not in real life. You'll know someone's really choking for real. They can't talk because if your airway is truly blocked, then there'll be no sound coming out, okay? So you can look it up on YouTube. There's, a, uh, um, uh, there's this one YouTube that uh, I, I looked up years ago. Uh, no, I don't have the time to go find it. But it's uh, this young lady thought it would be funny to, um, to see how many cupcakes she could put in her mouth. And, you know, of course, all the friends are laughing. And then, then all of a sudden, she starts banging on the table and starts freaking out. They just thought that she was just celebrating the fact that she put 10 cupcakes in her mouth. But in reality, she was panicking and she could not speak, right? And it's because why? There's no airway coming in, right? So um, that's how you know somebody's choking. And then, of course, you, uh, you then engage CPR. Now, another thing you could try to do is what they call a blind sweep. Let's see if we can have a video of that. So if you have an unconscious uh, person's already choking. Now for an adult, a blind sweep is when you take your finger, of course, gloved, of course, and then you try to see if, the, see, first you look, and see if there's anything blocking the airway. If you see some, a blind sweep is when you start digging around. Now that's not advisable for infants and small children because if you start digging around in their oral cavity, you could push whatever thing that's blocking it further down into heavens forbid your, your the uh, uh, the trachea. Um, so that's what you could do if someone's choking and then they passed out. Or you could do what is known as the Heimlich maneuver. So, who is Mayo Clinic? It can so. happen in an instant. One minute there's friendly conversation around the table, the next minute someone's choking. Are you okay? Now, see, they say that's the universal sign of choking. Um, I've seen several patients in EMS and uh, I, uh, I, uh, and in the ward and in any places, they're not like that. They're usually freaking out and banging on the table and running around in a circle somewhere, right? And you can see here, right. according to the National right? Safety Council, he can't talk, he cannot speak. So let's see, what does he do? Now, if you can get your patient Charlie, upright, Okay, let's look at it. Oh, they're not going to show it. No, they're here. Okay. If it goes, if you can get your patient upright, you make your hand, you put your hand in a, make one hand in a fist and the other hand uh, will be covering that fist. And then you, then you do these thrusts that are up that are in and up like a J, whoop, like that. And that's supposed to increase your intradominal pressure and then it'll throw all that stuff out. Now also be wary because um, uh, to aim the patient elsewhere other than the table or it, because uh, sometimes they vomit and you don't want that vomitus because that's, a, that's potentially, remember universal precautions, any body fluids that's highly contaminant, that's highly, that's it's considered a highly, con, like a high, contaminant and contagion. Uh, so uh, you face them outward. Now, if the patient goes unconscious or if they're too big to get your hands around, then you do uh, choking, uh, uh, compressions. Let's see if they, oh, okay. If they're down already, unconscious and choking Let's see if we can get the picture of it right and there's that blind sweep and remember only can do that on adults don't do that on infants or children well that's cpr uh, 
say well, they're unconscious. Let's say they're unconscious. You straddle them here, and then you do the same compressions like you would do here on their chest, but here on their stomach. Again, pushing down and up and out. And what I also do is, because if they vomit, I, leave, I put their head to the side so that if they do vomit or, or cough something out, they're not coughing it out and then having it to come back into their nose or their mouth. And also, if you're here on the side and they start coughing and uh, um, vomiting, you tilt their head away from you. How many times that, you know, uh, I got vomited on there wearing, and this is a very nice uniform. We used to have these nasty green uniforms, um, but uh, you, you don't want to get this all dirty. So you always face the patient's face outward. And if you go through that, um, uh, that BLS course, they'll teach you all of that stuff. Okay. So that's for choking. So, so think Heimlich maneuver, stomach compressions. And again, if the patient's unconscious, you have to initiate CPR. Now, ear trauma. Anything happens to the ear, like they get their ear gets torn off or an avulsion, anything that separates from your body or it's like hanging off your body, right? Make sure you wrap it in a plastic and any plastic will do. Then uh, you put that plastic bag in another plastic bag or uh, wrap it around an ice pack, okay? Do not put the piece of the ear or the piece of the eye or their finger or whatever got lopped off. Do not put it, I'm giggling because I remember how many times I see it. Do not put it in a bag of ice because once the ice melts, guess what? You, um, now you have like an ear cocktail. How many times I'm in the ER and then, hey doc, I got my buddy's finger and it's floating in ice water. It, number one, that's gross. And number two, it's not viable. You put it, well, it, it, it is viable. It's amazing what surgery and microsurgery can do and orthopedics can do to sew your stuff back on. But you put it in a plastic bag, right? Then put that plastic bag in another bag that has ice, right? And then seal both, make sure it's sealed tight and um, um, get a piece of tape or, or, or label it. Uh, how many times I've seen people, uh, um, this one woman labeled a plastic bag with crayon. So by the time uh, the piece of her husband's, um, I believe it was his toe, uh, arrived at the ER, I couldn't read the plastic bag anymore. And she was too freaked out to tell me what the heck was going on. So eh, it was a, a little bit of a stressful uh, afternoon at the lovely emergency room at Lincoln Hospital in Bronx, lovely Bronx, New York. I miss it and I don't. Eye trauma as well. Anything that sticks out of your body, like let's say for example, um, like I had a patient, um, um, uh, a classic is uh, um, he was cutting up something uh, or, or sanding something with a belt sander and then he wasn't wearing any eye protection and it got in his eye. The only thing you could do is you must put a, um, a covering, right? And uh, they must keep it there for the duration until they reach the, um, the emergency room. And if there's any associated bleeding or anything leaking out of that, you just try to put uh, something clean, uh, like a towel or, or, or clean paper towels on it. And again, with emergencies, you always note time uh, um, and, and also always note the history because if the patient passes out uh, or becomes unconscious, then uh, no one knows what's going on. Patient falls, very, very common, right? Again, do not touch them immediately. You first assess what's going on and then um, you'll learn later in, in that um, basic life support and uh, maybe if we have some time during lab, we could show you how to move a patient as a unit, but always stabilize the neck. Uh, and one way to do that is, um, um, if you ever seen these things that EMS has, this stuff, it's like, uh, you know, not necessarily this, but um, if you don't have any like neck brace or uh, neck, um, uh, neck stabilization device that what, what they would have, 
one thing you could do is you could wrap um, a towel and make it like a tube, wrap it around there, and then you duct tape it to his, uh, to his back, shoulders, and face so that the patient doesn't move their neck. Because that's a big thing with any fall. We want to make sure that there's no C-spine or cervical spine injury, okay? Uh, and even if it's um, not even from a fall from height, even if it's from like just falling and, and, and just tripping over a toy or something like that. But fall from heights are also of consideration. If you fall downstairs or off the curb, uh, or in my case, last summer, I fell out of my car. Don't ask me how I did that, but I did, right? So that's a considered fall from height, all right? And, um, and in falls or any accidents, document loss of consciousness. Document if they passed out, again, time and place and what time they passed out and if they got, if they woke up, okay? Uh, because if they woke up and then passed out again, woke up and passed out again, that's of um, considerable consideration to the emergency medical staff and the emergency medical team in the emergency room. Fractures, dislocations, sprains and strains. Now, fractures is easy. That's what? That's a broken bone. And again, we, you want to stabilize your patient. So any of this, you want to stabilize that joint or that area. You don't want it uh, to move around. So again, as you can see here, do not move your patient. Keep, the, um, uh, keep limit, limit their movements and then assess for any other injuries. Because especially if you have a fracture, again, we're looking for any head trauma, right? And, uh, and things, of that, uh, things of that nature. And why do they cut it off like that? That's odd. Maybe they have it continuing here. Oh, yes. Of course, called EMS, right? Make sure to take care of any bleeding and uh, use a splint. And, and uh, when, uh, when you take that BLS course, uh, basic life support course and first aid, they teach you how to do all of this stuff. And uh, in our laboratory, if we got some time, I'll show you some of these uh, 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 quick ways to do stuff. And um, it can be, and we can even use household uh, items like a pillow and, um, uh, you know, um, and, and, and tape. Duct tape is a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, thing. In the military, we used it all the time. There's this stuff in the military called Navy tape. It's like duct tape on steroids. Um, it can patch uh, um, like metal and stuff like that. I'm not suggesting to put that on here, but you know, you can put normal duct tape uh, here. But again, you put tape, be careful, you know, uh, people have hair on their, uh, on their skin and you could, you could do more damage than good. So let's look at the types of uh, fractures. You need to know that. Let's see if there's a picture of it on the next page. No, there is not. So let's, let's look at a picture for our own edification. And it's based on these categories. So let's look at types of fracture. And whoop, there's some, all right? So you got the transverse right here, means it's a, it's a fracture that, go, that cut straight across. Linear, it's cutting down towards the, the shaft or the diaphysis. That's what this is called if you, why am I saying that was this? You should know what it's called. You guys took anatomy and physiology. Oblique, it goes diagonally. And displaced, of course, that's easy. It's got displaced. Spiral is when, uh, uh, you know, when you try to, have you ever tried to move your leg and your, your foot got stuck in the carpet or it got stuck on the, on the grass or something like that? And that's what this kind of fracture is. Now, green stick. Green stick is only usually with children under the ages of six or is it four? I can't remember. Green stick is only a partial fracture and they call it green stick and it only happens in pediatrics, only happens with little kids because little kids, you know how they say bouncing baby boy or bouncing baby girl? Little kids don't have a lot of magnesium sulfate and calcium carbonate in their bones. So their bones are bouncy. They're not as, they're very strong, but they're not as um, uh, compact as adult bone. 
So part of the bone is going to bend, and that's this part, and then only part of it is going to fracture. And that's called a green stick fracture, and that's usually a pediatric case. Not usually, that's a pediatric case. And it's usually a young person, like five, four years old. Comminuted is not so good. That is when you got little bits and pieces. Um, comminuted fractures are usually uh, impact fractures and or uh, bullet wounds. Uh, bullets are horrific because uh, what bullets do, especially if it has hollow point or uh, soft uh, metal like Teflon, when it hits a bone, it splinters off and it's got a whole ton of pieces. And those pieces uh, become immunologic problems. And it also becomes surgery. It makes, it makes surgery to, uh, to get all the pieces uh, a little bit more complicated. So those are some nice pictures. And let's see if we went through all the types. If that picture was good enough. Now, complete versus incomplete. Uh, incomplete is an example of green stick. And you can have a complete fracture, which means it goes, it snaps the bone in at least two pieces. You can have open or closed. Open is also known as compound. We don't like these because the skin is broken and then you're now open for infection. And we already went to comminuted. And uh, so complete, incomplete, closed, open, green stick, comminuted. And also we have this pick right here and I will make this picture available uh, um, since I talked about it. Oh, is how easy it is for me to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G erase all of this and put it as a multiple choice question. Very easy. So it should be easy for you to preempt me and look at stuff. Now, a sprain versus a strain. In, they're both the same thing clinically, but medically, when we're looking at it, anatomy and physiology, a sprain is uh, uh, damage to a ligament and a strain is damage to a tendon. They both cause the same things, um, decreased range of motion within the joint and also uh, swelling, pain, discoloration, right? They're both clinically look at the same thing, but remember the strain, T for tendon, and sprain is uh, damage of a ligament, okay? That's a good thing, and also I saw that on a reviewer for an RMA exam once. Now head injuries, remember loss of consciousness, that's a big thing. Any leakage of any clear fluid or any body fluid from the ears or nose, that is cerebral spinal fluid. That is a bad news. It means that my patient has a basal skull fracture. We are in, that's a scoop and run. Scoop and run is a slang term in uh, emergency medical service. It means that I'm not even gonna assess. This is so freaking dangerous that we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna put the patient on a scoop stretcher and then I'm gonna run. That means we're gonna go right to the emergency room. Let me show you the scoop stretcher. Scoop stretcher is one of these jobbies. Why do I use that word jobbies? You can see how it opens up like, uh, uh, and it, uh, you could, it sneaks the, the stretcher underneath my patient. So we can scoop my patient uh, and then go, go, go. Here's another one. Uh, but this one's the most common looking one. Or they're usually like bright orange or bright yellow like that. And even they're powder coated stainless so that you can easily. Uh, uh. So now you know a nice little EMS term, scoop and run. Now. Uh, Hematoma and lacerations. And what a hematoma? Hematoma, oma, tumor, hemat means blood. It means a really bad bruise, but hematoma could also mean that there's a blood dyscrasia or there's a problem with your clotting factors. So uh, any hematoma, whether it be in the scalp uh, or any of your body, that's something to note. And um, let's talk about the different kinds of wounds. kinds of wounds, because we're going to talk about bleeding in a minute. And I don't think there's a picture of that uh, in your, uh, 
textbook. Mm, yeah, I don't like this one. But hey, let's try it out, shall we? So again, just like the burns, we look at the wounds in relation to how much um, skin damage would it be? Because we now know that the layer of the dermis and the layer of the subcutaneous tissue underneath it has a lot of vasculature. And anything on the outside that comes on the inside, we're looking at what? We're looking at not only hemostasis, uh, my, my patient bleeding out, but we're also looking at any infection. Doesn't that sound like a beautiful both A and B question if I ask you what are the two things that we're assessing regarding a wound? So you can have an incision. These are nice, like box cutter uh, and also razor blades. Back when I was a kid, uh, a lot of people uh, taped lit razor blades to the collar of their, uh, of their jacket or whatever. So if someone messages you in a club, cut them. Yeah. Right? I'm not saying to do that. Sorry for the sound effects. But an incision, right, is a clean cut. Do you see how uh, the, ed the uh, edge approximation is good? These are nice because when we sew them up, uh, they don't uh, they don't have a lot of scar tissue but a laceration um, you know that's a really jagged cut these will definitely cause a scar and you can see they'll definitely bleed very well because at the at the level of the dermis abrasions those are just epidermis no big deal that's what we call a scrape puncture wound puncture wounds do not uh, go full thickness so it could only be on the outside, right? Like a small nail or a attack. But a penetration wound goes through all the layers, epidermis, dermis, and sub -Q. Now, the rule of thumb is if you got something sticking out of your body, do not remove it. That's what we call a missile wound, right? Uh, um, so let's say, for example, someone got impaled with like a stick. Um, I had a patient... Um, uh, it was pretty awful. Uh, uh, the patient was playing um, uh, like a touch football in the park and him and his friends, they, were, they thought it would be funny. They were trying to run through some woods with the football and then he fell and then a stick went through his thigh and his scrotum. Uh, so that's a penetration wound. And uh, his friends made things worse by ripping and pulling the stick out of his thigh and scrotum so it ripped and created a laceration wound and i was looking at his best friend going any reason why you took the stick out and he goes oh doctor he was screaming and yelling and it was through his balls and i'm like yeah well now you have an avulsion wound and a piece of his scrotum is hanging off of his stuff so if you have it a penetration wound just cover it up with gauze or with uh with um uh with a clean towel so that uh, uh, let, um, let the emergency room go deal with it, okay? Don't, because you might create more problems uh, by pulling things out. Same thing with bullet wounds. Like, in, it's, not, it's not like the movies where, oh, I gotta take the bullet out. Many times we leave the bullet in because if it's not bothering anybody, we just leave it in there. Uh, and it causes more damage than good than to to remove the penetration wound or to what they call a missile wound, like, um, like as in a bullet wound. Contusion, that's a really bad bruise, but it's not, not so bad. Uh, that's an okay bruise, how's that? Okay bruise, because you could see it's not going to the level of uh, the dermis, but you could see the hematoma, it's at the level of the dermis and it broke some blood vessels and now you have a nice little bag of blood right here. Don't poke it, don't do anything, just an ice pack and elevation, and it should deal with this hematoma. And I'll add that as well, because can I easily take that picture and go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or can I ask you, uh, show you the picture, uh, what type of wound it is, or I can uh, ask you, hey, laceration wound, does it affect the, the dermis, epidermis, both, neither. Abrasion, epidermis, dermis, both, neither. Hematoma, epidermis, I could do, do this all day. And you could do this all day too and preempt me 
before your um, uh, midterm. And speaking of midterm, it's only two weeks away. And it's cumulative. It's everything that we're all talking about here. So that's your uh, types of wounds. And again, if my patient is bleeding, you put down, uh, um, you put down um, sterile dressing or a nice clean towel. And the big thing in dealing with hemorrhaging, the big thing is that do not remove the initial uh, dressing. Now, dressing is anything that you put down on the wound. Uh, and bandaging is anything that covers the dressing, dressing, bandaging is, covers the dressing that, um, uh, that holds the bandage in place. But do not, in, I goes, do not remove the initial dressing. Because if you do, it, rem, it takes out the platelet plug and then my patient starts bleeding all over again. Okay, and again, you only have a typical seven, 70 kilogram patient, only has five liters of blood. It's very, very easy uh, to go into shock. Shock is when, uh, especially hemorrhagic shock, there are different types of shock, but shock is when your body, your cardiovascular system can no longer pump blood to the periphery. And that's not good. Um, and hemorrhagic shock is one of them. When you bleed out, and then you start getting really dizzy. Uh, maybe uh, some of you uh, who had uh, an extra bloody uh, childbirth. Childbirth shouldn't go more than 400 cc's. If it does, my, my patient could um, uh, go into shock. Now, if they're bleeding really bad, right? And you can't find the bleeder, especially on a limb, we could utilize a tourniquet. But you want to hold, you want to have the tourniquet uh, done, and you could use a stick and some string, but the important part is to have a marker so you could put the time on when you applied the tourniquet. And then you have to put the time when you release it because you have to put it on and releasing it, put it on, releasing it every couple of minutes or so because uh, if you just put the tourniquet on and you transport the patient, you're, uh, um, you're gonna cause um, a circulation problem which will uh, promote uh, gangrene, infection, and also eventual amputation, which is, an, uh, is a not, not good thing. So you could look it up on YouTube on how many minutes, but ultimately on a tourniquet, what's important is the time. And you can see here, they, they put the time of when they put this tourniquet on. And again, you're applying a tourniquet. That is a scoop and run situation. Do not pass go. Do not call your, do uh, your doctor and say, hey, I put a tourniquet on. Do you think I should go to the emergency room? I've had a couple of those calls when I was a medical assistant. Remember those numbers that we uh, discussed earlier? Poison control is one of those numbers. And these are the things. And on your poison control little card, you should have these things on there so that when you call the poison control center, you can really know. My patient's name is Emily. She's 28 years old, female. He goes, I believe she ingested blah, 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 blah. He goes, this is how much I think she swallowed. And uh, it looks like I just got home right now, but it looks like she swallowed this about in the last 30 minutes. I, I looked around, I don't think she vomited. And then do what? Again, scoop and run, it's time to go. All right? But uh, especially if you suspect it and, and you're not quite sure, right? Another thing you do, especially when you scoop and run, you monitor vital signs, okay? Do not induce vomiting. But if they vomit, let them vomit. And this is why. If you induce vomiting, stick your finger in their, their throat, they induce vomiting. The, uh, if, the, if the material that they vomited is caustic or reacts with your mucosal lining, it will burn It'll burn your um, esophagus and your, even parts of your trachea and your pharynx and your oral cavity and your teeth, not once, but twice. It burned it once when the patient swallowed it and it burned it the second time when the patient vomited it up, okay? So do not induce vomiting, but if they do vomit, again, put their head out of the way. And if you can, take a picture of it 
or get the vomitus in a, ba in a bag so that the emergency medical team uh, um, at the hospital can know and analyze what it is, okay? Absorb poisons, inhale poisons, and again, it, 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 it roughly has the same protocol. Make sure you try to get as much information down, and um, uh, if you have that uh, laminated card that I was talking about, it really helps, especially if you know, you've never had this happen to you before. Weather-related issues, hypothermia, frostbite. Uh, again, um, hypothermia is a serious, serious thing. And um, um, it's, it's really easy to diagnose. Uh, your patient can't move around a lot. Many times, uh, true hypothermia, you won't be able to shiver because you're all shivered out. Um, they have no m muscle energy and uh, their body temperature is under, uh, is uh, a degree or two under 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, and the way you deal with it is you come around with blankets. Uh, and again, oh, by the way, the first thing you got to do is get all the wet clothing off of them, right? And if they're at the level where they're stuporous and confused, don't know where they are, um, uh, uh, that's an EMS situation. Frostbite, you know it uh, when it happens when your, your fingers and your toes and your ears and your nose. Uh, they're exposed to um, uh, extreme cold, right? Um, and it has to be freezing temperatures. And the best way to treat it, of course, and again, again, same thing, get out of the cold, slowly warm them up uh, and cover them up and to get, uh, um, to get their temperature uh, back up again. And if their temperature doesn't go back up again, again, that's another EMS problem. Heat stroke, ooh, very, very common. But we, we want to be a, a, a careful because if they, my patient starts becoming dehydrated, um, uh, they can go into hypovolemic shock. And uh, dehydration is a big, big emergency, especially for vomiting, especially for diarrhea, uh, because uh, dehydration can easily turn into hypovolemic shock. Okay? So you, only, you not only get hypovolemic shock with just bleeding out, you also can get it if severe dehydration. Now you could ask, what does dehydration look like? Looks like this. And what does dehydration look like in a baby? Adults can handle dehydration pretty well, unless they're a more elderly patient, right? You, um, uh, but babies and infants, be careful for um, the following signs and symptoms that aren't, um, that aren't um, directly mentioned here. One of these things, especially with infants, is the fontanelles or the little soft spots in their head, they'll start to shrink. If you look at their eyes, um, a person's eye, eyes uh, or the lens of their eyes should be nice and watered and you could see your reflection. If you cannot see your reflection in your baby's eyes, then that's a problem. Altered mental state. Now that could be either, um, what do you call that? It could be either, um, extreme. It could be either uh, they're very sleepy or they're very agitated and, and moving around a lot. So if the baby's crying a lot and agitated, that could be, and mommy knows best. You always, you always ask mommy uh, what's going on. Okay. And again, uh, uh, heat stroke is a big, big thing, of course, in the summertime uh, and heat stroke with dehydration. Um, I DJ uh, several hotels in the Atlantic City area during the summertime. And um, always when I do the cabanas and stuff like that, there's always one or two jokers in the afternoon. They, they, they power drink and then by in 30 minutes, they become dehydrated because remember alcohol does what to your system? It is, it'll dehydrate you and especially beer um, is a diuretic. It makes you pee. And then you have your, uh, uh, the hot weather and you're dancing and you're having fun. And then next thing you know, timber, and then they fall, right? And every once in a while they get a seizure. And it's just, um, it's, it, it, it's just something that's highly preventable. We already talked about this, the different types of wounds and what they look like. And we're gonna, I'm gonna have those pictures available. 
uh, for uh, your viewing pleasure. Abdominal pain. Remember uh, your PQRST um, uh, protocols regarding uh, history taking regarding pain. Oh, here's some bandages. Here's some stuff that we could go over uh, in laboratory. Nice to know. But they'll definitely, you, got, you have definitely have practical examinations if you take that um, first aid course that I was telling you about. Now asthma, the big thing of course is shortness of breath, SOB, also known as dyspnea. If my patient uh, uh, is my uh, asthmatic, remember um, their inhalers are golden and backup inhalers. Um, so make sure uh, um, if you have an asthmatic uh, staff member that they have some sort of backup, uh, um, backup supply for their nebulizer or for their inhaler. Dehydration, we already discussed. Diarrhea, and remember, diarrhea, whether it acute, be it acute or chronic. Acute means it just happened to you right now. The biggest thing that we're looking at is dehydration. So we gotta pay attention. So if they're starting to have a rapid pulse, their, their blood pressure starts dropping, cool and clammy skin, that's the beginning of hypovolemic shock. And if they're having a history of diarrhea, something to think about. Fainting is called syncope, right? And again, just like with any loss of consciousness, make sure to document it. Fever, make sure to document it. And we don't want a fever greater than 106. But if the fever is like 99, low grade, under 100, don't give a Tylenol or acetaminophen or ibuprofen immediately. Just uh, let the patient hang out, especially if the patient's not in distress. Because the function of a low grade fever is to give the pathogen, whether it be virus or bacteria, give the pathogen a, an unfavorable environment, right? And then and the fever will either go down naturally or if you really don't like it and you don't like the low, low grade fever and you don't wanna give acetaminophen or ibuprofen, you can do um, a, um, a hot compress. And how do you do that? You take like a, a, a medium bowl of uh, warm water and then you put a cap full of 70% isopropyl alcohol, you mix it, and then you take, you know, uh, a sponge or you take, uh, you know, um, a nice towel, you dip it in there and you make it moist, you know, drain off the excess, you put it on your patient's head and you, you, you swab them down with it. It should reduce your um, uh, body temperature uh, a degree or two. Now, if that doesn't work, of course, then hit them up with the acetaminophen. And if the acetaminophen doesn't work and their fever keeps on going, that's a scoop and run situation. Go, go, go. Something, uh, um, something else is wrong there. Now, again, we do not want the patient to get to uh, near 106 degrees Fahrenheit because that's a unfavorable environment for your brain. Your brain will start having, uh, giving you seizures. Seizures then will lead to the sequelae of a coma. So please pay attention to fever and do your uh, you future nurses and uh, future orderlies, do your monitoring. When the doctor says monitor temperature every hour on the hour, please do it. Even though it annoys the patient at three o'clock in the morning, you gotta do it because uh, dehydration and hypovolemic shock and all these things uh, they're, they're a lot of times in the, in, in the ward or even in the office setting, it's uh, preventable. Epistaxis, that's another fancy term for nosebleed. They're common, uh, but if it doesn't, uh, if, it, uh, if it doesn't uh, abate or, or decrease, then my patient could have a blood dyspraxia, they could have something wrong with their nose, uh, something wrong with the mucosal lining. There's a whole bunch of things. And how to deal with it. Do not tilt the patient's head backwards. Tilt it forward so that all the blood will empty out. Okay? And you shut the nostrils with a gauze, pinch them down for uh, five minutes, and of course have the patient breathe through their nose. 
uh, and if that doesn't stop the bleeding, uh, you pack uh, the nose with uh, gauze. And then you, uh, if that doesn't work within 10 minutes, uh, pack the nose again, uh, get, the, uh, get the patient to uh, um, a physician. Now, tachycardia palpitations. What are palpitations? This is not a good thing. Uh, it could mean anxiety. It could mean a cardiomyopathy. So palpitations, normally, even, you know, even if you like run up and down the stairs, you really should feel or see your, uh, um, uh, you know, your heart beating. And palpitations is when the patient, it's usually with rapid heart rate, the patient can feel their heart, uh, their heartbeat. And that's not a good thing. Vomiting, we already talked about. Anaphylaxis, we already talked about. The drug of choice for anaphylaxis is epinephrine. So have your epinephrine pen at the ready. Make sure your you know how to use the EpiPen. Make sure that the epinephrine pen is not, um, is not uh, expired. They have a shelf life because it is a drug. Diabetic emergencies, the hypoglycemia is one of them. Uh, just a little sip of sugar or maybe a, a candy bar if uh, my patient goes hypoglycemic because many times they may not have properly, con um, properly administered their sliding scale for uh, insulin and um, they went hypoglycemic. Now, hyperglycemic is the exact opposite, right? And it does have, um, they, they all have the same um, signs and symptoms. And can my patient go into insulin shock? Yep, because if I bottom out, if I bottom out all my sugar, will I have enough energy to circulate uh, in my body? No, I won't. And then I go into a lovely coma. And a coma is when uh, your brain does not like the environment that it's in, so it shuts down so as to um, uh, prevent any other brain damage. And, that's, and the diabetics, they get coma, they get keto, ketotic comas because um, uh, their body isn't getting enough uh, glucose or fuel, so your body starts throwing out ketones. And we already know ketones are neurotoxic, and uh, you're going to have a whole bunch of neurologic and even psychiatric signs and symptoms before my patient goes into that coma. Heart attack is known as an MI, myocardial infarction. You couldn't do much, right? But if the patient is unconscious, uh, you might have to hook up a, a defibrillator on them. And what's a defibrillator? An AED. Something like this, but this one's huge. You could see that you put, you put it on this part of your chest, on the left side of your patient, and this part of the, the chest, uh, and that's your apex, and that's your base. So you just follow the instructions, and then it tells you what buttons to press. And again, step away from the patient or you're going to get zapped too. And it hurts. It's not fun. Don't look at this uh, um, CPR stuff because it's outdated. Every year they seem to change it. Hematemesis, that's when you're throwing up blood. That's never a good thing, right? Try to collect the vomitus if you can uh, um, uh, for the emergency team to look at. Obstetric emergencies, uh, I don't know, seizures. In obstetrics, you just, anything baby, uh, get them to the emergency room um, because uh, you'd rather be safe than sorry. Now, seizures. What's important about seizures? Wow, we're going to the distance today on today's lecture. Um, seizures, the important part is let the patient have their seizure. Your job is not to put anything like a spoon in their mouth because you could do damage and you could actually close up their, um, their airway. The best thing, excuse me, the best thing to do is just move the furniture out of the way, get everyone away from the patient. And when the patient wakes up, they're gonna be confused. So uh, make sure and assure them that everything's okay. They're like, oh, what happened? What's going on? And also get, get rid of the, the, the people who want to watch. 
because it's very embarrassing. They wake up and they see everybody, you know, uh, look down on you and like, hey, you okay? Shock. We already talked about hypovolemic shock and we already know that shock is the failure of the cardiovascular system to do its job. And you could get hypovolemic shock. You can get septic shock from uh, all it takes is some bacteria to get into your blood and then uh, you'll become septic or, se or you'll have sepsis and then your blood and then your uh, cardiovascular system will shut down. Uh, another uh, kind of shock is cardiogenic. That means, um, and that's what we're afraid of uh, with heart attacks. I'm not really afraid of the chest pain and it's called angina and the heart attack, the myocardial infarction, the MI. I'm not so concerned about that. I'm concerned of the cardiogenic shock that will follow and the heart failure and on and or um, pulmonary failure that will ensue. Okay, and that's why we get excited about heart attacks. Another thing we get excited about is stroke, also known as a CVA, a cerebral vascular accident. And knowing this fast is important. So what are you gonna see? Facial drooping, patient can't smile, or for it, like um, uh, the one thing you'll notice is that they, they're gonna have like an expressionless, expressionless face. Uh, uh, I remember my wife since she knew fast uh, about eight, nine years ago, she scoop and run her own father uh, because she recognized that he was having a stroke. Uh, she went to go see him right before she went to work and she saw that his face looked different, like it had no emotion and he had this blank stare and he was weak. He couldn't get up out of his bed. So that's A or arm weakness or both arms. He couldn't even lift up his arms to get out of the bed. Speech difficulty. If the patient can't repeat what you said, and all she asked was, she was like, Papa, do you know who I am? And he was like, ah, 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 ah. and then what did, she, what did she do? She wanted to call 911, but, but what did she do? Her and, uh, her and my son uh, picked him up, put him in the car, and, drove to, and uh, drove to Inova, ran all the lights. Or you can call 911. But I believe that, I believe she saved her father. It was pretty good. And after, uh, and she stayed calm and she didn't, she didn't wig out until when that they said, yes, it was a stroke. We have to admit him. And then that's when my wife fell apart. It's her father, uh, for, for, uh, you know, and it's hard when you treat your family members. But I thought, I always tell that story because that was beautiful because she goes, yeah, I remember my training fast. And then F A S T facial drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty, T, time to call 911, right? TSST, toxic shock syndrome, uh, not too common. It's usually when um, it's a staphylococcus infection gone bad. Um, you get TSS when, or uh, usually when you uh, keep um, your sanitary napkins, you don't change them out or tampons usually happens with patients of mental disease or defect or um, uh, some of the homeless population. Like they're so high on whatever they're on that they, that they don't swap out their sanitary napkin and then they get TSS. Encephalitis, only thing you need to know about any brain inflammation or any brain, um, uh, anything with the brain, uh, glove up, mask up, don't be in that room. It's highly contagious and it's deadly. So uh, any virus that ends up in your brain, because remember your brain is sterile and for a, a virus or a bacteria to get up there, that is not good. Psychosocial emergencies, know what to do with the anxiety patient. We already talked about that before. Know what to do about uh, the nervous patient, okay? Disaster, pandemic, eh, we don't have to talk about that, right? But um, regarding like suicide and things of that matter, right? Again, documentation is always key and always keeping your patient calm is always key in any uh, questions that I ask about uh, emergencies, okay? And here's our like disaster stuff, which by the way is on your, um, your, uh, your medical assistant registry exam. 
uh, they have one or two questions regarding this stuff, but I'm not going to go over this for our lecture purposes. Okay. It's like prepper stuff. So all the procedures, take a good look at them. But I, again, I'm more concerned about uh, what, uh, what we talked about and these two pictures that also I'm going to uh, add as well. And you have a ton of videos and a ton of stuff. Uh, and I hope everyone looked at the, um, uh, um, because I sent a couple of private messages to people on the chat. So kindly look at that as well. So it is at this stage where I